Welcome to Act Two, You're On. Join us weekly at our studio roundtable as Rhonda, Kate, and Linda invite spectacular guests to weigh in on staying sexy, vibrant, and healthy. Launch your next great act with authenticity and purpose. Summon your courage, superstar, and step into the limelight. So grab a coffee or a martini and let's set the stage for a grand entrance. It's Act Two. You're on. Greetings, friends, and welcome. I'm Kate Levy, and I am just so excited for this interview. But first, I must say what an unmitigated pleasure it is to podcast with my remarkable co-hosts. I'm Linda Tai. And I'm Rhonda Garvin-Conaway, and we are joined by our very skilled and talented producer, Kathy Carswell. Friends, the reasons I am so downright giddy today is not because it's Valentine's Day or the season of love. It's simply because we are talking to one of the top dogs in the world of animation and children's programming, and one of the most creative human beings I know, and he also happens to be one of my oldest friends. So I'm particularly thrilled this day in the Act Two You're On studio. So listeners, before we begin, I'm going to ask you a couple questions, and they are, what's your relationship like with failure? Does failure scare you away from trying your next big idea? Does the prospect of failure keep you from living your big why? What if you could make friends with failure and you could just bake failure into the whole creative approach to living and your creative process for your best life? We have an expert to help with those tricky questions because he's best friends with failure. Our guest is the incomparable Tone Tyne. Tone is the vice president of creative at Fable Vision Studios. Tone oversees development and production of the studio's original animated properties, including television, games, apps, and other digital content. He has acted in the role of writer, director, showrunner, runner, and executive producer on several long and short form projects for Ardman Animation, Sesame Studios, The Dodo, Superprod, The Boston Pops, Houghton Mifflin, Harcourt, Spin Master, and Guru Studios. Recently, Tone was showrunner head writer for the Netflix hit series, Go, Go, Corey Carson. He was executive story consultant on Disney's Pickwick Pack and the supervising producer of the Emmy award-winning series, Wonder Pets, Nick Jr. During his 11 years at Walt Disney Feature Animation, Tone contributed to blockbuster films, including The Lion King, Pocahontas, Tarzan, and Toy Story, among others. He has produced animated projects for Mattel, Nickelodeon, PBS, and Sci-Fi Channel, and has animated segments for Sesame Street. Tone is a former board member of the Fred Rogers Center and the co-creator and co-executive producer of the CSA award-winning series, The Adventures of Napkin Man. Friends, it is my pleasure to introduce this Valentine's and in the season of love, somebody I truly love and admire, the remarkable Tone Tyne. Welcome, Tone. Thanks ever so much, and thanks for having me. And also, by the way, if I could just acknowledge the fact that you referred to me as your oldest friend rather than your dearest friend. Yeah. So I just He's very yeah. sensitive <laughs> about his prison <laughs> state. Yes. No, you are very <laughs> dear to me, and you are also much Thank older you. than I am. I think <laughs> I am a month. <laughs> so, yes. my friend, I'm going to jump right in with some gotcha journalism. Are you prepared? All gotcha. Right. Got, got it. Got so, it. Yes. prepare yourself. I am going to ask you to come clean here today publicly. Is it my imagination or does Napkin Man bear an uncanny resemblance to Naked Man who you used to draw <laughs> in high school? But clothes. Um, man does may, have maybe, clothes. maybe. <laughs> Yes, maybe just in name alone. Uh, when, when I was, uh, I'll, let me let me fill your dear listeners in on that story. So oh, we need God. I, I, I was going to ask if she did Napkin Man. I want to know. <laughs> No, Napkin Man has the only, I think, similarity to Naked Man might be the last name. But um, what happened was I was uh, in high school with Kate. I was uh, going to be taking my first figure drawing class, which was a, sort of an extracurricular thing that was going to be happening in town. And I was uh, young. I was, you know, in the 16-year-old range. And I had heard that the models were going to be unclothed. I was very nervous about that, Uh, especially. I just had this vision of, uh, you know, naked people all over the place. It was very, very nerve-wracking. And I was building up to that day and getting more and more and more nervous. And so um, 
when I got there and I'm standing in front of my easel and the door cracks open, this man walks in with this robe, sort of velour, possibly, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> um, and completely disarming and then completely disrobing. Um, and then he uh, he proceeded to pose for us and we were drawing him, but then there would be frequent breaks where he would come over and stand right behind <laughs> us and check out our drawings not taking the time to put the robe back on. And so anyway, I would uh, I was telling my friends the story. And as I was referring to this man, I was referring to him as naked man. I'd say naked man was then stepping up behind us. And I realized in telling that story how much he sounded like a superhero. And so um, from there was born this uh, idea that we would have a fun time with where we would make up these little, um, I don't know, little jingles, I guess, about naked man. So I'll, I'll give you one of them. Um, he flies through the air with the greatest of ease. My God, where does naked man keep his keys? <laughs> so um, it, it goes on, but that's not what this podcast is about. So uh. <laughs> so the challenge of being Tone's friend, well, it's only this, that your face hurts because you <laughs> laugh constantly when you're with him or you smile. Uh, and Tone and I were very lucky to meet when we were younger and at a very special point in life when your friends deeply, deeply influence you. And I know that Tone's creativity, his optimism and his big hearted approach to life and its challenges forever shaped who I am, but specifically how I engage and help others engage in the creative process. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about your story and also um, how you've developed this kind of robust creative process and, um, and this relationship with failure. Mm -hmm. Yes, I've got an excellent relationship with failure. Well, let's begin at the beginning. So way, way, way back in the beginning, I think, um, as you've sort of alluded, you and I are the same age, and we were born in 1969, which is the same year that Sesame Street was born. And uh, we belong to a generation, I think, that was really influenced by that show and Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, The Electric Company, even 3 to one Contact because uh, we were really the target audience for when that show came out. You know, it was kind of finding its way as we were finding our way. And then by the time we were really at our formidable learning years, uh, that show had really gotten its legs. And so really, I, I like to believe that, you know, we were really the first generation that was really benefiting from that show. And it's really fascinating to me how many people, uh, colleagues of mine in my industry, in the children's television world, are around the same sort of age. And I think it's really because we all want to kind of give a little bit back, give back what we got. And uh, and I really do think that that was such a huge influence. It's really impacted all of my decisions and sort of my journey and really trying to find my way to Sesame Street, so to speak. And so anyway, so let me, let me fast forward a little bit from the day that I was born and uh, tell you that uh, I had... I had grown up doing a lot of doodling. I was constantly drawing. A um, hundred years ago, there used to be these things called greeting cards that people would um, buy at a store and sign their name to it and put it in an envelope and send it to your friends. Remember we those? Remember those were uh, fondly. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, so those uh, that's what I thought I wanted to do. I thought I wanted to be an illustrator. I wanted to design Hallmark cards for a living. Uh, so when it came time to go to college, I chose a school that had a very strong illustration program. I went to the University of the Arts in Philadelphia. And uh, in your first year at art school, often uh, at that school and then other art schools, they make you take what's called foundation classes. So in foundation classes, you have to take sculpture and painting, and graphic design. You take a little bit of everything because the wise people that uh, run those, organiza those um, institutions understand that artists think they want to sort of apply their art in one way, but they actually might be better at expressing it in another way. And you just might not have had exposure to it. So you get an opportunity to take a whole bunch of classes in your first year before you declare any of them your major. And uh, I ended up taking a, an elective in animation in my first year. And the first assignment was to make a flip book. And I took these little doodles of mine that I had been doing my whole life up until that point and put them into a flip book and flipped it and watched them move. And I realized at that very moment that I've got to have some sort of a God complex because when I created this life, I was just uh, completely smitten with the art form. And I thought, wow, I could actually make these little doodles dance and come to life. And uh, I declared animation my major right then and there. 
Um, so I went into my sophomore year um, having had no experience in animation at all. And, I, and I'm in class with all of these people that are such animation enthusiasts. I mean, they wouldn't mind me calling them this, but they were such animation nerds that, uh, that I felt really, you know, out of my league, out of, out of their league. Um, and they would come running into the, into the classroom each day with like photocopies of a drawing. They'd say, look at this new drawing that Glenn Keane did. I didn't know who this Glenn Keane guy was that they all kept talking about. They sort of idolized this guy, Glenn Keane. And it turns out he was this Disney animator that, um, he would animate all the main characters at Disney. So for example, he did the beast and beauty and the beast and he did Pocahontas and um, several other really important main characters at Disney. Um, anyway, so there I am in, in class. Uh, I, the instructor of our animation program was this guy who had gone to Cal arts. Uh, Cal arts got two tracks. It's got an experimental animation track and it's got a commercial animation track. This guy had gone to the experimental side of things. And so he was kind of teaching us, you know, how to make experimental animation. So I was becoming a real pro in sort of paint on glass and watching it animate, but I wasn't learning how to make a character walk or talk or anything like that or, or emote. And, uh, you know, and I was the scrappy kid that was kind of trying to keep up with everybody else in the, in the class. And uh, when it, I sort of worked my way through sophomore year and then junior year, at the end of junior year, I decided, you know, I'm going to have to go somewhere and learn how to how to be an animator. I need to, I need to figure this out. I got to learn what everybody else already knows. They were all going off to this place called the animation house in Philadelphia to do their internships. That was kind of like what you did when you were an animation student there. And I thought, you know, I could go there, but I'm going to be the scrappy puppy. That's like trying to keep up with everybody. If I go there too, I need to go somewhere else and maybe somewhere where maybe those guys aren't going to be there. So I make myself a list of all the places that are doing animation at the time. It was, and I put it in order, Disney at the top and then Warner Brothers and Hanna-Barbera. And I went in order of all the sort of the biggest places all the way down to the animation house in Philadelphia. And I said, I'm going to just call all of these places. And when they all say no to me, I'm going to end up at the animation house, but it couldn't hurt to try. So I ended up uh, going over to Disney and weaseling my way into a, into an internship there. Um, right off the bat, which I, I couldn't even believe. And uh, I was going to be an intern at, well, at Disney Television Animation working on, um, there was a show called DuckTales and uh, Rescue Rangers. I worked on those for about two days when in Burbank, California, uh, over that summer, when uh, Disney Feature Animation called and said, we could really use an intern over here. And Disney Feature Animation is kind of the top dog over there so they get whatever they want so disney tv animation had to sort of surrender me over to feature animation when they were working on rescuers down under at the time and uh and a little short making a short called prince and the pauper so uh, i went over and i became an intern over there and one of my first jobs was to go in and collect time cards and so i go into this guy's office uh and uh i say hi i'm, I'm tone i'm a new intern he says oh hi i'm glenn keen and uh, I was like, what? You're that guy. <laughs> um, and, and I think Glenn kind of appreciated that I uh, didn't geek out about him uh, the way that maybe my classmates might have <laughs> they met him. But, uh, you know, Glenn was just an ordinary guy for me. Anyway, so I spent the summer working at Disney, getting to know some really amazing people there. And more importantly, I think getting a glimpse into what the process of animation is. You know, it was something that I was learning that summer that I had never learned in school up until that point, and certainly not in my life up until that point. And I was a production intern, which meant I wasn't doing any drawing or anything like that. I was really doing a lot of the sort of the administrative support. Uh, but that was fine with me. I mean, I was really happy to do that because I was getting a chance to meet everybody. I'm going to tell the long version of this story, and you just go ahead and edit this if uh, if you think it's too long. But um, but anyway, so I uh, I go back to school. So everybody said go go back to school, finish senior year, and then as soon as you're done with senior year, come back and you're going to get a job at Disney. So I was thrilled. Um, so I went back to school, and I'm in class with all the nerds, and uh, they're all talking about their summer. What'd you do this summer? What'd you do this summer? And then they get to me. I say, oh, I. I did this internship at Disney Feature Animation and they lost their minds because here I am the worst guy in the class and I'm the guy that gets the job <laughs> at Disney. <laughs> um, so anyway, so they're all kind of 
trying to figure out how they're going to go work at uh, at some place when they graduate senior year. And I was, you know, sitting back pretty going, well, I'm all set. I don't need to, I don't need to do anything. I've got a job waiting for me at Disney whenever I'm ready to go. So it was really the tortoise and the hare situation because um, those guys were all, you know, scurrying around looking for work and I'm sitting back under the shady tree. Um, we were planning a trip to, so I was going to be graduating in May and uh, my family was planning a trip to California, just a little holiday thing. My father, who has six kids, uh, is quite organized, very meticulous about planning. Uh, and uh, he had planned out our trip to Southern California that uh, that break. And uh, he had it all figured out. We're going to do Universal on Monday. On Tuesday, we're going to do the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Wednesday's your day, Tone, to go over to Disney, get your fill out the paperwork, get your job. Thursday, we're going to Disneyland. And then Friday, we're out. So I knew that I had that Wednesday to go over there. So that Wednesday, I'm in California. I saunter on over to Disney. Hey, guys, remember me? Uh, what do I have to do to get this job? I'm going to be graduating in a month. And they said, we just had um, what's called an austerity program kick in, which means we're doing a hiring freeze, which means nobody is able to get hired. So now I've got a month before I graduate. I've told everybody that I'm going to work at Disney. And they're telling me that I have no job there. and uh, I begin to panic a little bit. And so uh, at the time, Disney had several different buildings in Glendale, California. So one building, for example, had Lion King going on in there and the other building had Hercules going on and the other building had Aladdin. You know, it was it was like that. So I basically did my rounds. I went to every building that was in that circuit trying to kind of meet with people that I knew that summer saying, can, can you give me a job? Do you think you might have a way to give me a job? You know, one of those deals. I met with one of the producers there and um, she was the producer of Aladdin. What ended up happening was uh, I, tr I tried to get in to see her, see if maybe she could hire me on Aladdin. She was too busy to see me. And uh, I told the receptionist who I was friends with, I said, oh, I've really got to see her today because I'm I'm leaving town tomorrow. She kind of read that like it was uh, I was going back uh, back home to Texas where I lived. Um, so she calls the producer and says, uh, "Hey, he's going back to Texas tomorrow. He really needs to meet with you." So uh, we and I ended up getting weaseling into to see her. I basically just showed her my face. I gave her my resume. I said, "If you have an opportunity to hire me, please do." And uh, it didn't seem very promising. So instead, I went over to this other building where they were doing what's called development, where they were coming up with, you know, planning out the ideas for the next film. And uh, I met with this woman over there that was heading up development. She said, Tone, you came at a perfect time. Uh, I actually have the okay to hire a production assistant. So tomorrow, actually, we're going to be having an organizational meeting. And I'm going to bring up your name and I'm going to tell everybody that I'd like to hire you. So I was thrilled. So I was feeling a lot more optimistic about this. And uh, I went to Disneyland the next day with my family and like a crazy person, because, you know, this is the day before cell phones. I was I was riding Space Mountain and then I was calling the hotel. Did anybody call for me from Disney? Uh, and then I would uh, ride Splash Mountain and then I'd call the hotel. Did anybody call for me from Disney? Um, finally, uh, after I think going through the Haunted Mansion, I called again and uh, and they said, yes, somebody called for you. And I get the message and it's Disney calling and saying, the good news is we're going to hire you. You're going to start. Uh, so go home, graduate, pack up your stuff, come out here. You're going to start on this day. And uh, I did that and I moved out to, to Burbank, California, and I got started on my first day. And while I, on my lunch break, on day number one, I went down to one of the other buildings. I went down to the Aladdin building and I asked to speak with that producer. Um, who I'd given my resume to. And I said, uh, hey, uh, it's me. Remember me, Tone Tyne. The good news is you don't have to hire me because I ended up getting a job. So you don't worry about trying to, trying to find a spot for me in Aladdin. And she was furious with me. So um, she says, she takes her glasses off and leans forward on her desk. And she says, oh, I know you got your job at Disney. And let me tell you something, mister. If it were up to me, not only would you not have your job at Disney, but you wouldn't be working anywhere in this industry. And, and I said, huh, what? 
she kicks me out of her office. So with my tail between my legs, I go, but this is day one. I go back to my, my new boss and I say, listen to what just happened. And she says, oh, I know what that's about. She said, we had that organizational meeting the next day, like I told you. And I mentioned to everybody that I wanted to hire you and everybody was in support of that. And this one producer said, oh yeah, yeah I saw him. I met him today. Uh, here's his resume and his phone number's on that. He's back in Texas with his family today. And uh, my new boss said, uh, no, no, no. He's at Disneyland with his family today. I have the number to the hotel where he's staying. And so suddenly, apparently, this big giant meeting that had all the producers and all the directors at Disney and all the executives sort of devolved into this, this heated debate about this Tone Time character who came in and half the room felt like, the fact that I had been dishonest about going back and that I needed to see this producer today was a sign of somebody who's very resourceful. And the other half of the room felt like that was a sign of dishonesty. And to be working in a department, for example, like development at Walt Disney Feature Animation, where they're coming up with brand new ideas that the world is not supposed to see yet, did they really want to bring somebody dishonest in there? And by the way, I couldn't be more of an honest guy. I'm a terrible liar. And, uh, and I never really even lied to her if I could just simply, you know, plead my case here. It was a misunderstanding. Now, admittedly, I never really corrected the receptionist when she said he's going back to Texas. So so anyway, so she was furious about that because she was made to look the fool, I think, in that meeting because I had sort of like pulled up fast one on her. And I think she was ready to sort of make sure that I never worked in the industry again. Well, this is a terrible way to start on your first day at a wonderful place like that. So I went back and I, I hand wrote a letter to her and to the receptionist basically that said, please understand that I had, you know, I, I, I meant no malicious intent. I certainly didn't mean to make you look foolish and da, 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 and apologize and please forgive me. And I, got up at five o'clock in the morning and I went over to her office and I slipped it under the door and I sort of hoped and prayed that she would get that and forgive me. And months went by and I never heard from her. And luckily she was in the other building. Um, and it was the kind of a situation where people were constantly walking from building to building. And honestly, there was this one time where I saw her with a bunch of executives walking down the street, very far off in the distance. And uh, mind you, I'm only like a 19 year old kid. But anyway, I see her walking down the street and I dive into some bushes and I hide in the bushes before <laughs> as, until they pass, just so that uh, I don't have to, I don't need her to sort of point me out, you know, hey, you see this guy, you see this liar over here? What ends up happening is that she eventually finished the project that she was working on and moved into the office, into the building that I was in. And I suddenly had to support her. I was one of her assistants, actually. And, uh, and it turned out great. And she ended up loving me. And uh, we became really great friends after that. But it, it was actually a really interesting way to sort of start off my career. And, you know, sadly for me, it was a little bit of a foreshadowing of, of what was to come. In not, not the lying thing, uh, but just in terms of, you know, <laughs> getting getting your hopes. No, I, ne I never lied again or, 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 let, anybody, or let anybody, very, let anybody lie for me. very noble. <laughs> Then I ended up being at Disney and I, and I stayed there for 12 years. And what was interesting about my time there is that I, um, as I had mentioned to you, I was a production intern. Uh, and so when I went to go work there as a production assistant, I got put into the production assistant sort of on the, on the production side of things. So at Disney, there's two tracks. There's a track that ultimately leads, it's a production track that ultimately leads to being a producer at Disney. So that person is the person that will understand and make sure that the, the project gets finished, that everybody has what they need in order to get the project finished, all the logistics kind of stuff. There's the creative track as well, that uh, ultimately, if you stay on that track, you'll end up being a director at Disney Feature Animation. So you get, you get through different departments like storyboard artist or cleanup animation artist or animator and all that stuff, and you work your way up on that track. What's interesting about those two tracks is they diverge and they start moving apart from each other as the longer you're on that path, which means if you're a little entry level uh, production person like me, uh, it would have been very easy for me to hop over to the creative side. I was a PA for a little while and then I became a storyboard assistant or something like that. But I kept getting promoted on the production side of things. And the longer I got promoted, the more I would, the further away from the 
the creative side I would get. What ends up happening at a place like that, big studios like that, where you have a production, very robust production pipeline and a very robust creative pipeline is that unfortunately what develops is a little bit of an us and them kind of a mentality where the creative people sort of see the production people as getting in the way of their creative vision. You know, the production people have to make sure you get done on time, make sure you get done on budget. And so, for example, if you were to give a creative suggestion, you know, if you're far along on that production track, it's difficult for the creative people to hear that suggestion as simply a creative suggestion without being dubious and going, are you just making that suggestion because you think it's going to get done faster if I do that? Are you just saying that because you think it's going to be cheaper to do that? And suddenly your credibility as a creative person begins to diminish. The more you get promoted and the further along you get on the track, the further away you get from being a creative. And I didn't mind that so much because I was learning so much while I was at Disney. And I was having opportunities that I really, to this day, I just really cherish. I mean, I was in meetings with Michael Eisner and Jeffrey Katzenberg and Alan Menken and Stephen Schwartz. And I was there when the celebrities came in and I was recording um, Demi Moore and Mel Gibson. And I was right there with everybody when they were doing their thing. I got the chance to read opposite of Tom Hanks when he was reading his lines for Toy Story. And I never would have been able to do any of that stuff if I were sitting in a little cubicle with my headphones on and my animation paper, you know, just by myself. It's sort of a lonely existence being uh, an animator sometimes. So um, so I was really enjoying my time. And next thing I knew, it was 11 years later. I feel like I should probably pause for a quick second and let one of the three of you talk. (laughs) Well, I'm just going to sort of say what I admire, well, there's so many things to admire about you is that you actively put yourself in the pathway of luck. And sometimes things go awry, but you are very active in in trying to be successful and you also can suffer. You have a high tolerance for discomfort. And your story, Mm. because I know more of your story, is reinvention and some f- flopping, but I, I also think you have this healthy, robust relationship with failure because you just kind of bake it into the process. And it doesn't mean that you're not suffering, but uh, I think for our listeners, it's really good to hear your story, the role modeling of it, but also to know that somebody who is very successful actually has had scrapes and bruises and misunderstandings and uh, it is good for and had to and, and had to jump at the bushes one time. Yeah. <laughs> well, probably more than once or twice, maybe four times. Yes. <laughs> but it makes me wonder uh, if you could share just what is that within you. So whether folks are in your line of work or they're doing something different and and they're encountering barriers and boundaries and the nose, what what is it that you rely upon within yourself to be able to withstand the rejection or failure? I mean, for me, and I don't know exactly where I got this, but I mean, it's always been a little bit of a game, you know, and I know that's going to sound really difficult for some of the listeners, but because not everybody has the same attitude about it, but it becomes a challenge, you know, like, okay, they said no. So, you know, um, just to fast forward a little bit, I mean, I make a living right now trying to sell uh, original content, you know, to the broadcasters. And there's a million of them out there. When one of them says no, then that's great. That's, I don't really start until I get a no. And then it's like, okay, game's on. Somebody just said no. Now, how do I get somebody to say yes? And just like, as I was describing with that Disney story, I mean, there were several buildings. There wasn't just one building. I didn't just go to the one building and they said no. And then I went home. I said, okay, those guys said, no, there's another building. Let me go over there and ask them. They said, no, let me go to the next building. And there's lots of ways to get what you want. And we'll talk about this a little bit later. Um, But I think the, where did I learn that? Nobody ever told me that. I think it was really just by doing it and finding, hey, this works. And I've really applied that same idea to every uh, sort of experience created uh, in my career that I've had is as soon as somebody says no, get on that horse and, you know, try to find the next one that's going to say yes. Um, I had this teacher in eighth grade. She used to write these quotes up on the board every day. And our job was to come into class and write down into our notebook the quote that she had written up on the board. 
And I don't remember any of them except one, which was run to the roar. Mm. And, uh, and she explains the quotes, of course, and says, you know, when, when you're afraid of something, don't run away from it, run toward mm. it. And I, I use that so much. Uh, and that was a million years ago that she had written that up on the board. And I think about that all the time. And I have ever since I learned that. In fact, actually, I remember when I was asking somebody to the junior prom, I was so nervous. I had to you know, call her on the phone. Uh, and I was so worried about overheating. I remember I actually had a fan in front of me, <laughs> like this little <laughs> circular fan, and I turned it on full blast. And I called her to ask her to the prom. But all I kept saying as the thing was ring, as the phone was ringing, was run to the roar, run to the roar, run to the roar. I think by the time she answered the phone, by the way, I think I sounded like Darth Vader because you know, you know, when you talk into it <laughs> into a fan, I was like, do you maybe want to go to the prom? <laughs> But anyway, so uh, run to the roar is really the thing that I always think about, you know, as, you know, somebody says no, then I begin to run uh, until I, until I get to the yes. Sorry to leave you at a cliffhanger, friends. You'll just have to tune in to the next episode with Tone Tyne. Two tone interviews is better than one. Part two, finding the next yes, drops on Thursday, February 17th. It's worth the wait. Act 2 You're On was brought to you by Act 2 Share Our Stage. You can find us at A2YO.com and also on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Please listen and subscribe wherever you find your podcasts. You can support us using Patreon. Thanks for listening. 